Okay, uh, sorry to interrupt everyone's conversations, but we're going to start the, uh, the last um, presentation of the conference. Uh, and I think all the sound is coming from the people in the mirrors, actually. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, so this uh, project that um, Sarah Owen I did, I should say, it actually, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to blame um, Diana Wu uh, because about a year and a half ago, she said, you know, there's this thing called Cody. Um, and then we started well, got into this piracy stuff. Uh, and um, Mike's going to comment on, on it because this is actually his field uh, and we're, we're encroaching. Um, so he knows, what's, he knows what's what, we don't. Uh, and I also want to thank um, Nathaniel Lovin, who is our, he's over there, our research assistant on this um, because he figured out how to work with a data set that has about four trillion observations. And that is not an easy task. Um, but speaking of easy tasks, tasks, I'm done for now, and Sarah will take over. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for listening to our research. Um, this paper is called Meet the Video Pirates. So just to start off our key takeaways, um, pirates look like everyone else. The pirates among you, I bet if we polled people here, some of you might um, have seen a pirated movie or downloaded um, a stream. And in this paper, we'll f we find evidence that pirated video crowds out non-pirated video, possibly one-to-one. -one. And so there are many ways that we come to this conclusion, and we're still working on the econ um, econometrics. I can tell you a little bit about our data set. So what we have is the Comscore Total Home Panel. If any of you have seen the Comscore data, um, Comscore looks at households in the US that have um, internet um, connections. So their universe um, in this data set is 8,000 homes um, that are connected to Comscore software. They log every interaction with the internet from every device um, in, in every house that's in their study set. Um, in our data set, we look at September 2016 to November 2017 um, internet browsing behavior. We include 19,000 unique households. Um, there are over 400,000 devices in our data set, and that's unique devices like every hand, handheld phone, um, every tablet um, is uniquely coded. Um, so we can tell, we can see the device usage over every day in that time set. Um, and it's really, I've, not, I've never seen this kind of data before, but we can see the back end of um, all the data that's flowing into households. So just to, um, from my observations, I've, I'm learning a lot about the ad, tech, ad technology. Um, half of the, um, data in this Comscore Total Home Panel is advertisements. And so we see like the double click network, um, and we see like all the banner ads, um, we can see the JPEGs and the pings, and so it's, it's, it's a lot of data. Um, we have 65 billion rows of data um, times 62 columns, and yeah, it's, it's really great. Nathaniel um, is also working in this data set with me. We use Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud. So we're using BigQuery. Um, and so we're in the cloud. There's no way that we can manipulate the data um, on our hard drive computers. Um, so Google might be happy. Um, but you know, we did we did shop around. We looked at Amazon Web Services and their Redshift product. We looked at Microsoft Azure, um, but the Google BigQuery product was the easiest to learn. Um, and we also didn't use permission to use their logos. So um, maybe I'll turn it over to Scott, and he can talk about the devices that we're seeing. Sure. So, like Sarah said, we have um, there. Are hundreds of thousands of devices in here, and we, they, we, we know them uh, at many different levels. So we have uh, 41 different platforms. I'll give examples of this in a second. Within that, 217 brands, 331 product lines, 1,100 product line families, uh, almost eight, uh, 1,800 models, and all of them from 793 different manufacturers. And so we know each of that for 
every um, for every device. And just as an aside, some of them, uh, you know, most of them are the ones you would expect, iPhones, Roku, and so on. But when you when you dig down, you see some very strange ones. Like we we saw a, a lot of pirating from a, a stationary bicycle. And um, you, uh, you know, as you sort of dig down, it says stationary bicycle all the way down until you get to a manufacturer, and it's, a, um, it's an electronics company that makes wireless stuff. So if somebody kind of had figured out a way to disguise their, um, their device, or, else that, or either that or convert their exercise bicycle into a, into a pirate machine. Um, so all right, with these devices, you have the platform. These are things like a phone, computer, tablet the streaming box and stick and so on. And so you can go from there, dig down, look at the phones. Within phones, we have the brands of phones. They're the most popular ones. Obviously, there are many, many more. And within that, we can see the, 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 the product line of the phones. Uh, and these are the things that, um, you know, these are the Apple products. From there, we go down to the product lines. And that's all, these are, in this case, all the iPhones. Um, uh, and of the iPhone 6 is actually, in our time period, still by far the most popular, uh, the, the model we see the most. Um, and that there's only one. Um, and we come down to the manufacturer, which is listed as that, and that's, that's Foxconn. Uh, so that's not, not a surprise. But that's how, that's how that data is structured. So we can see, um, we can look at the distribution of, uh, of, of devices in households. And so these are the most common devices. This is the share of households with a particular type of connected device. The blue bar is the beginning of our data set. The red bar is the end of the data set. It's not a huge time period, but enough to see differences. Um, the phones stayed about the same. And some of the things that, are more that we thought were interesting is that you see a, a real decline in um, house uh, households with computers and households with tablets. Uh, and we, I'm doing some other work on, with the CPS, and, and um, you see this decline in computers in that too. I mean, so it's 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 real, um, and smaller declines on set-top boxes and, and gaming uh, consoles. And at the same time, we see increases in streaming boxes and connected TVs. Uh, and with connected TVs, of course, we don't know if, if that's by preference or because you can't buy anything but a connected TV anymore. Um, but I thought the most interesting one, although it's not really related directly to privacy, I mean piracy, are smart speakers. Um, they went from nothing to uh, about 15% of all households. And again, that seems so strange. I, you know, sort of we, we looked up and kind of various analyst reports have it at, at, at similar um, penetration. So that's kind of, that's kind of amazing. Uh, so now we can look at what, um, what, people, what people actually watch. And so this is um, the average streaming of non-pirated uh, sites by day in a household and different, um, for different uh, um, sites. And so the, you can see the bottom is, is Amazon, the red is Netflix, green is Hulu, the yellow is YouTube, and the blue is other. See, the co colors kind of match, except I didn't know what color YouTube was. Uh, and you know you can sort of see a steady a steady growth. Um, some seem some of you see like uh, Netflix, if anything, seems to be getting a little bit smaller. But as you'll see, um, you know that's because the number of subscribers. We'll see that also the number of subscribers keeps going up. So there might be possibly these are averages. So it could be that the new subscribers watch less than the older subscribers. Um, we don't we don't really know. But this shows uh, kind of just uh, aggregated what we see about streaming. The peaks are the weekends. People watch more on the weekends. That's true for pirated and non-pirated uh, video. So just looking at a few of the services, um, this is the number of households watching by day. So this is not the number of subscribers. Uh, this is just the number of households um, watching by day. And the, sorry, the data set includes um, weights, just like the census, um, census data does. So it's supposed to be representative of the US population. And, this, and um, so it should, be, it should be giving you, if you believe the weights, um, an accurate rep representation of the number of people watching it. And again, you can see the weekends at Amazon um, increasing uh, up until sort of the end, and it, it got flat. And um, this is also interesting because Laura Martin, who was mentioned earlier, she gave a talk about uh, streaming some months ago and had pointed out that some of the analyst reports had Amazon really falling off at the end. And she said, you know, it didn't know what that was all about. And we still don't know what that's all about, but it, it shows up here too, which could mean the analysts were using the same data, and it's wrong here and wrong there, but at least it's, it's consistent there. So 
Then we see with Netflix, uh, again, you can see the increase of households watching per day. And so this, you know, we see about 15 to 20 million people watching per day. If you think that their number of subscribers in the US is around, what is it, 50, 55 million? Um, this seems kind of reasonable for a given day, um, unless you have kids, in which case you think they watch every day. Uh, and another interesting thing is you can see the growth of what are called um, virtual MVPDs. These are uh, like Sling. So these are cable companies. They act like cable companies, but are strictly over the top. You, you, know, you sign up, and online you get every channel that you would get on a cable company. And I think that um, you know, the traditional MVPDs are, are worried about this, and if they're not, they should be. Uh, and you can see that here, these viewers, they watch an average of just over four hours a day. And so you can see that being a much closer substitute to um, traditional cable where people watch, you know, I think it's around five hours a day. Okay, we can also look by um, time of day. And here it's, it's uh, you know, it's not surprising. You have most people watching at, during prime time and that's whether they're watching regular OTT streaming, whether they're pirating it, whether they're watching through a, a, a Kodi box. I didn't even define Kodi boxes. These are these um, streaming, they're streaming boxes that allow you to access sites that um, often aren't, uh, that, that show uh, often strictly pirated, um, sometimes streams, sometimes movies. Kodi itself is not illegal. It's, it's, it's a platform and it can be used for um, plenty of legitimate things. Uh, but the boxes that, that run these is a big phenomenon of what they're called Kodi boxes. But if you think of them sort of as uh, streaming devices, stream, uh, streaming devices that uh, make it possible, make it easy to uh, facilitate, uh, to, to, to pirate, that's where it is. So now just a very, very brief history of video piracy. Um, you know, this has been a problem for a long time. Uh, and, you know, a while ago, it was mostly just um, bootleg DVDs. And that was a big problem. We heard lots of estimates of, of, of losses. But it still was a, a physical device. And it was pretty easy to identify when it was um, when it was pirate. Um, you know, you can tell here, Adam Sandler was not in I Am Legend, as far as I know. Um, and The Mighty Loin King might have been a great movie, but it was, you know, it was not the, the it was not the Disney release. Um, uh, and I, I don't want to minimize the problem, but it was, it was of a different sort of um, magnitude then. Uh, although it did make it into a Seinfeld episode, if you remember, when Jerry took a handheld camera into the, um, into the movie theater. But then there are also there are these um, uh, what were called cyber lockers. I don't think we really call them that anymore. But where, um, where pirated uh, movies and anything digital actually was stored in these sites, and Mega Upload being one of the most famous, uh, that was shut down, Rapid Share shut down. Um, but now we see, yeah, I think you, this is where you should come. Um, so for part of our paper, we also have a list of like the top um, thousand websites where people commonly pirate video. Um, and out of those domain names, we searched our database and we found, we collected that web traffic. Um, and and just in that um, set alone, we separated out like a field called MIME type, which tells you what type of packet data packet you're looking at. Um, and so in free time, I'm scrolling through and seeing like what's coming out of the pirate websites. And you can see um, the pirated movies, films, and TV series. So here's an example, Moana. It shows up um, in our data set as Moana 2016 Blu-ray.vtt. So someone downloaded Moana. Um, you also see Zootopia, Zootopia 2016, 1080p, 3D, Blu-ray.mk. So the whole file is coming across the internet. Um, and, and there are many examples of this, like I found Huntsman's Winter's War, Blu-ray, 720p. Um, and it's actually pretty transparent in the internet traffic data that we see. Um, other examples, um, even original TV series of all different um, studios, Homeland, season three, episode five, in HD, um, in MP4 format. Um, we see Sherlock, season four, episode two, um, House of Cards, 2013, season four, episode 11. Um, and you can see like all the different seasons. You can see um, just anything P3 
people are searching for. And this is just a small example of what um, is going across the internet into American homes. Um, and also video piracy through Kodi. Yeah, so we also found kind of an indicator website where I think it's called offshoregit.com, where people with Kodi sticks often go to another website um, to look at a menu um, of different um, offerings off of um, illegal streams off of Kodi. And so that's how we tagged um, the Kodi traffic in our data set. Um, and Kodi, which it's legal as a platform, but the apps on it can be illegal. Um, is, it's a different um, piracy mechanism than prior forms of piracy. Um, it's easy to acquire. Apparently, um, Kodi is put on Amazon Fire Sticks. Um, the pirate sites can look very professional, and the streams can run easily. Um, and consumers, they might not know that what they're watching is illegal. Um, and so recently, there are headlines, like I think two weeks ago, Facebook um, limited advertisements for Kodi sticks um, in their terms, and Amazon has also been trying to um, not promote Kodi sticks. And so for, for the Kodi subset, um, you, you read those kinds of headlines. Um, so now um, I can show you a little bit. We can say, let's meet the pirates. Who are they? Um, and we looked at income distribution. We looked at age, education. Um, and here is a comparison between pirate, um, pirate households and legitimate streaming households. In green, you see the legitimate streaming households by income. Um, and it's pretty consistent across um, income. Pirate, we see kind of a, a jump up at 250,000 or more. Not sure who that is, but you know, in demographic numbers, there aren't that many households up there, so it might just be. Um, I just wanted to add one one thing to that. Um, be, uh, because of the nature of the data, uh, we we have to do a whole bunch of things to. Uh, to, to sort of get uh, comparable information on the streams. And so like if you've seen other uh, figures about um, of video streaming, you'll see a, a stronger decrease in streaming by income as you get uh, um, higher. And you see that here, but it's a little bit, um, it, it's, a, it's a little bit muted because we're looking at, at this is gigabytes of streaming. And you know, depending on what, whether you're watching HD or SD, gigabytes will turn into different, um, you know, uh, 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 different hours. And so this could be, you know, could be, uh, you could have things like wealthier households having faster video streams, more likely to pay more for HD, and that's why it's at the higher incomes. It's it's higher than if we were to just take the pure OTT data, which we've also done, but we're not showing here. And the the two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more, it's so striking that. Um, you know, we thought it might be just an anomaly because that happens, or we screwed up, um, or probably if that's the case, I screwed up. Uh, and um, but it's it's you know, we have several different ways of doing it, and it, it's 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 pretty consistent. It's very robust. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I didn't explain. We have three or four different ways of measuring the pirate volume. So we have bytes sent over the network. Um, we have. 15-minute um, increments if there was engagement with a website or not, like a one or zero in a 15-minute increment um, block. And then we also have another data set from Comscore on um, duration uh, on OTT services, so in seconds. So we're kind of working with three different quantity numbers and trying to um, compare between the three. This um, chart is on bytes. And so like Scott said, there are different considerations. Like we don't know the bandwidth of a particular stream. If, if it's 4K, that's a lot of bytes for 15 minutes. Um, so there, you know, there are considerations there. Um, the next slide, we look at head of household age. Um, we have pretty much every demographic for the household. Um, we have number of children, number of teenage boys, number of teenage girls. We have number of people in the household. Um, we have some race categories. Um, and then here is age. Um, you see, I don't know, it's pretty 
consistent as well. It's demo by demographics, there are more people. Except that for that 80 year old who just is probably a huge amount. That's, we grade that one out because there's something going on there that we Yeah, <laughs> who is that 80 year old household? Yeah. Oh, we also have um, television market, we have zip code, um, we have education level. Um, yeah, we have a lot. So this is teenage boys. Households with more teenage boys stream more, but they don't pirate more. Um, we have pirate and legit legitimate video by platform. So the PC Mac, the streaming box stick, the phone, the router, tablet, gaming console, connected TV, handheld device. Um, we also have streaming by operating system. So we can compare um, operating systems of the pirate devices versus the legitimate streaming devices. I'll let you do that. Um, I, I just want, I want to um, emphasize uh, a couple of a couple of things about the devices and platforms. So I mean, this stuff we've, we've normalized all of this, uh, but um, uh, still, despite the boxes, most of the piracy still happens over computers. Uh, you know, desk, desktop and laptop computers rather than others. Whereas you can see for legitimate stuff, people are using their streaming boxes um, or they're now they're connected TVs. Uh, and so there's a difference there. Now, if we look at the operating system, I'm sorry, the, I should have chopped this each one in half because you don't really need to see the ones where there's nothing. Uh, but the, um, the pirate devices run Windows and Android primarily. Well, and then the third one is, oh, Mac, right, because there's uh, other computers running it. Um, whereas with uh, legitimate ones, we see uh, Roku, and that ties in is, um, I believe that's Samsung, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and so there's this big difference that uh, pirate, uh, we see a lot of piracy coming through Windows OS. And that's important because that, I mean, for the econometricians, that's going to be part of our identification strategy. Um, so here's the, the empirical, the real empirical problem. Um, people who pirate a lot, watch a lot of everything. Um, so if you don't control for anything and you just look at a correlation between the two, you're gonna find a positive correlation. Um, you know, pe people who pirate, watch pirated video also watch regular video. Uh, and so if you just did a straight correlation, you might say, hey, look, it's, it's, it's stimulating additional legitimate traffic. But you have to find a way to, um, to control for things that affect each one separately and to identify, to truly identify the effects of piracy, um, not in a way so that, you, not in a way that you're uh, trying to get it to be negative, but that you're, you know that you're looking at the effects of piracy and not just conflating these, they, not just conflating the, um, the, the desire to watch a lot of video. Uh, and so to do that, we need to something that predicts pirated streaming but not legitimate streaming, or at least less so, except through the piracy effect. And that's where the Windows operating system comes in, because it's much more strongly predictive of, um, of pirated video than of non-pirated video. So we have a, a little two-stage model. Um, where the first is, what predicts piracy? Uh, and then the second, we take that, um, that, that, that prediction, that uh, sort of what we call fitted value, and then we put that into the second equation, which is then how does that um, uh, amount level of piracy that controls for these other things, uh, including this, what we call this instrument, how does that then affect legitimate streaming? Um, and so some of those things, so the Windows variable is, is a key one, but we, there are lots of other things we include. Importantly, for example, what we call household fixed effects. So there might be specific things per, for each household that affect their tendency, uh, predilection to watch legitimate video or pirated video. Um, and so we control for all of those. We're not going to show them because that's, what, 16,000? Yeah, I don't think we want to show 16,000 results. Um, and other things like number of people in the household and so on. And so I'm going to show you some very abridged results, which is, which is in some sense really unfair because you can't ask questions about the other things. Or you, know, you can ask them, but then you don't have any way to know whether I'm telling you the truth. Um, which is not just who I am. Uh, so this is sort of the results of, our, of, of, of this model. Now I want to say that these are, these are preliminary. I want to say there are a lot of caveats, because you know, as Sarah said, we have lots of different ways of measuring the quantities of, of the different streams. Um, there are reasons to believe that uh, you know, a gigabyte of pirated streaming may not be exactly the same thing as a gigabyte of legitimate streaming. Um, so I want to be, I want to be very clear about that. 
Um, but so first you see that this Windows uh, operating system being very strongly uh, correlated and statistically significant um, with, uh, with, with pirate, uh, the, the amount of pirating that, that's going through the household. Um, age of household is one of the ones we include. It's not, not significant. I'm not sure why I included it in this one. But then you go to non-pirate um, non bytes, so the, the non-pirated streaming, and you look down to the third one on the left, pirate bytes, and so the, the, the coefficient, the minus 1.5, that, if, if our instruments are good, uh, that says that um, for every, every pirated byte that goes to the house, they reduce the non-pirated bytes by about, it reduces non-pirated bytes by about 1.5. So, you know, take into account the confidence interval, and that's kind of, it seems like kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence. Each, each thing that you watch that's pirated is one less thing that you watch that's not pirated. Um, and, you know, take into account all the caveats I, I said, um, but we think that's, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty robust result. Uh, and the, the, the but it's, it still depends on the specification in the sense that in some other ways that we measure it, we'll get much bigger uh, crowded, what we call crowding out effects, like, uh, you know, up to four or, or sometimes in some cases even 10, and those are just not, simply not believable. Um, whereas with this specification, it, it's, it's, still, it's still believable. It's always robustly negative, though. Um, so, you know, that seems to be the bottom line, that uh, pirated video crowds out non-pirated video, and we have some evidence that it's one-to-one -one based on all the assumptions I, I gave. Um, yeah, all the, all the caveats. Um, I don't know, Sarah, do you want to add anything else before we hand it over to Mike? Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of caveats. Um, this paper is not ready for publication yet, but um, we have the model, we have the data, and we're going to um, keep working on it. And so I just want to thank Nathaniel because we ran a lot of SQL queries on this data set to put it together. Um, and um, hopefully within a year, we'll be able to submit it somewhere. Yeah, we'll Thanks. Sooner than that. Sooner? <laughs> <laughs> So cool. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to discuss this paper. Um, I, I'm really excited about what, uh, what Scott and Sarah are, are doing. Um, I've divided my discussion into three parts. So the first part is, is the general question interesting? Um, do we care that, that what, what piracy does to the industry? God, I hope the answers are yes. Um, spoiler alert, uh, no. And, and then the second question is, is the specific question interesting? And then, and then let's talk a little bit about the methods, right? So first question is, is the, is the general topic of, of piracy at, at all um, interesting and, and, and relevant? And here, if you, if you read certain blogs on the internet, you might get the impression that there's some active debate in the academic literature about whether piracy hurts sales. Uh, Rahul, my colleague Rahul Talang and I just finished a lit review for a, a World Trade Organization chapter. Um, 26 of the 29 peer-reviewed studies that have looked at this question have found that piracy has a statistically and economically significant harmful effect on sales. More or less, this, this question is settled among academics who, who look at this. Um, if you want to argue with me after, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but, but you're wrong. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so piracy hurts sales. Do we care, right? You know, it's possible to model piracy hurting sales as just a wealth transfer. Creators are worse off, consumers are better off, uh, who cares? So the, the question, and, and this one is, is not as conclusive, but, but the question that uh, we're playing around with and some other people are playing around with now is, when producers make less money, do they invest less in, in creative output? Um, as economists, we believe that's true, but can you find that in, in, the, in the data? And it turns out that, that there are a set of papers coming out that find that is, that is exactly true. Uh, Rahul has a very nice paper with Joel Waldfogel where they look at investment in India around the time piracy, VCR-based piracy became popular in India. And what they find is uh, when VCR piracy became popular, not only did theatrical revenue go down, but the number of movies made went down significantly and the quality of those movies, at least as measured by IMDb ratings, went, went down. 
Uh, Brett Danaher and I have a paper that looks at Academy Award nominations in high piracy countries versus low piracy countries. And we found that both countries had a lot of, you know, a healthy number of Academy Award nominations for domestic output before BitTorrent became popular. And then there was a big drop off in Academy Award nominations for the high in the high piracy countries. Um, again, and I guess Rahul has a paper right now that, that looks at this in the context of digital cinema in, in, in India. Uh, digital cinema made it easier to make money, uh, and what he's finding is that output went up um, in, 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 in Bollywood. So again, I think there's good reason to believe this is an interesting general area to look at, not just because it hurts the industry, but because if it hurts investment in creative output, it hurts all of us. We all ought to care. Um, and again, if you want to argue with me about that, I'm a tough guy. Um, okay, so the next question is, is this specific question interesting? Oh, and I guess I should also say that, that several of the papers that found piracy hurt sales found it with pretty big numbers of substitution. So uh, again, Joel Waldfogel has a paper that finds uh, about a 20%, yeah, 20% substitution rate in music and a one-to-one -one substitution rate for, for movies. Um, that, that a one-to-one -one is higher than I would expect it to be, but it's not, it's not out of the lane. Um, and, we'll, and we can come back to that. Is this specific question interesting? This specific question is incredibly interesting because most of the literature has looked at peer-to-peer -peer piracy and in the context of downloads. Um, the industry has moved, uh, both, both industries, if you will, have moved quite radically in the past five years from peer-to-peer -peer more towards streaming piracy and from individual downloads more towards uh, uh, streaming, streaming services. So I think a paper that helps us understand what is the impact of piracy, what is the impact of streaming piracy on streaming consumption is, is absolutely fascinating and uh, you guys deserve uh, credit for being one of the very few that's, that's wandering around in, in this area. Um, and then the, the data, I think, you know, the, the data is an incredibly rich data set. I was going to say, you know, kudos to these guys for even being willing to wander around in a data set that big. I would normally just tell a doctoral student to go do it and good luck. Although it sounds like yeah. Nathaniel was your doctoral That's student. So um, uh, anyway, thank, thank you, Nathaniel, for being willing to wander around in this, in this big data set. Um, I like the instrumental variables approach. Uh, it's, it's not quite, quite, you know, sort of angrist uh, draft lottery, uh, you know, uh, style, but I, I think you can make a nice argument that, you know, Mac versus, Mac versus Windows is, is a good, is a good uh, instrument. I think if you wanted to quibble with that, you might argue that the same sort of people who are unobservedly more interested in, um, you, you know where I'm going? Same sort of people who are you have an unobserved that causes them to be more interested in media might also be the people who are more likely to to, to buy Max. Um, that said, I think I think it's a, a creative creative use of the data, and and I, I find the results um, you know higher than I would have, would have expected, but but in the plausible range. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, I guess if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to try to answer them. Um, Greg. <laughs> um, so it seems interesting that you have you know, sort of this one-to-one -one substitution, but you don't, I, at least I didn't see how big, you know, it may be one-to-one -one substitution for those who download, but are those who pirate stuff 1%, 10%, 50% of the people, so to get an idea of how big this issue is. I didn't, I don't think, did I miss something or did you guys figure that out? Um, it seems like you have the data, you can do that. You know, we've, we very cleverly skipped over that. Uh, we, I, I, identifying the pirate, all of the pirate streams is um, one of the biggest challenges uh, because we, we have to know exactly what the sites are and we've got the top thousand. Um, so we think we're doing pretty, pretty well, uh, but there, we think there's more. Um, and among the, among the households who pirate, what, what is it? It's pretty, among the households who pirate, what is the share of piracy? Do we, do we have that? Oh, I mean, it's not, uh, it's so we run our numbers on the whole U.S. population. Um, if you look at only the pirate households, the results will look different. Um, and 
But if is you that, pirate, what is it? A share, a share of the legitimate? Do you remember? Oh, I don't remember that yeah. number. Um, yeah, but that is important. Yeah, as a descriptive. It, it is, specific. and it's something we're struggling with because um, mm -hmm. it's a big deal, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Richard. It's, it's not just 80 year olds. Oh, right. It's, it's a big deal. Right, despite the stereotype. Yeah. yeah um, I, like, I like what you did here. Um, but I think that using bytes of content as the constant measure between the legit and the pirate streams is really going to distort your, your findings because uh, pirate streams are much more compressed than legitimate streams are, in my experience observing this for a long time. <clears throat> and it could be that, that that effect also plays into the distribution of piracy by income levels. Because people, uh, if it's popular content, they have a choice of what resolution to download it in. And if they are doing it on a, on a broadband plan that has a data cap, then if they're low income, they're really incentivized to go with the lower resolution format to save on you know, their data cap issues. And, I, and I, in fact, I think the difference between a pirated and a legit stream can be as much as 10 times. And so if you could <clears throat> you know, sort of tease out the resolution or sort of do it by uh, instance, of the title rather than the length of the stream, then I think you'd probably get a lot more meaningful results. But, you know, it, it, so that one-to-one, -one, you know, could become like a five-to-one substitution of pirated content, yeah. which doesn't all necessarily get viewed. I mean, because people download a whole lot more for free than they actually, l turns out they really want to watch the whole thing, you know, from right. beginning to end. Well, despite all that you said, <clears throat> uh, you don't know the half of it. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I mean, we have lots of different measures of quantity, and they all have problems. Um, bytes, uh, the size of the stream being, uh, some of the problems being the ones you, you mentioned. Um, and also, your, uh, the point about the, uh, how, the, the, uh, how pirated by may be more compressed than others would help explain a result that's bigger than, than, we, um, than, than we might have expected otherwise. And we've been trying to, figure, trying to figure out a way if we can measure that. But we also see things like, we you know how many times we don't know exactly what to call it, but kind of how many times the device interacted with, with the server. So if somebody's watching Netflix, you see Netflix, 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 Netflix. But if they interacted with a pirate site, you see pirate site, and it might just have downloaded the whole thing. Um, so you know caching gets gets involved, and so we've done all kinds of little tricks, and Sarah should talk about them. Yeah, we can also talk a little bit more about how we're estimating bytes for pirate sites. We're actually also observing how efficient each of the OTT services are by bytes. So like it appears that Amazon is really efficient, um, and so is Netflix, but Hulu and Sling are not efficient for the same number of quarters or duration. So you see the byte counts like a lot higher for Sling and Hulu compared to Amazon and Netflix. And so we use kind of, we kind of triangulate and find an average stream, because I don't know how many bytes is in a good stream or not. Um, so we use those averages and we compare like quarters and, and the comm score data in seconds, um, because our measure of quarter could, quarter hour, sorry, a 15 minute block could mean they're watching seven minutes or it could mean they're watching the full 15 minutes. I mean, maybe, maybe we, maybe Nathaniel, maybe we need to measure <laughs> seven minute blocks. So it depends on how we're aggregating the timestamps. Um, yeah, we're, we're not letting yeah. Nathaniel go back to school. Um, <laughs> well, but, he uh, gave me all his code, oh, like okay. Paul Romer said, so I can r run his code. For a couple weeks, yeah. 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 Um, but the other thing is that this data set it came in, I mean, many, many pieces. And um, they provide, uh, Comscore provides, or they have a different way of measuring the, the, the time, how long you're watching for the major sites like Netflix and so on. So we have this other piece of information um, uh, so we can try to see uh, actual duration of watching Netflix and then back, it, back, back out from the other data we observe. So we kind of reverse engineer what they did and apply it to the other, the other sites. Yeah, so. yeah, so we have comm scores like 
polished report, and then we have the raw data that Comscore used to make their report. And so we're kind of seeing how they measured, because they also need an algorithm to figure out from the raw data how much people are watching the services. It's not like Netflix is reporting to Comscore, who's reporting, right. like Comscore is um, figuring it out from the raw but data But that's as their well. secret sauce, so we yeah. have to figure it out. So we're figuring out the Comscore report uh, as well. Um, uh, Roger, and then Bill, and then. Have you done an endogeneity test on the operating system? Um, yes, actually. Uh, but that was about 2 o'clock um, yesterday morning. Um, <laughs> I, you know, according to the tests, it's a good instrument, but I'm not convinced. I mean, for, for the reasons that Mike said, I, I, I'm not 100% convinced that the theory really holds, right? I mean, we can make the case that it passes certain tests, but I, I don't know. I just don't want to just rely on that. We should report it. I, I didn't understand the answer either. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yes, we ran some tests um, on the instrument, and it seems to be a valid instrument, not necessarily a weak instrument, but I'm, I, we haven't convinced ourselves 100% that despite uh, passing those tests, we, um, we're, we completely believe that it's a, a fully legitimate instrument, I mean, largely for the reasons that Mike was, was saying, and that's, I don't know, I, we need to feel more confident. So, Sarah, you at the beginning said half of the traffic was advertised at MS, and that's in yeah. bytes. So I was uh -huh. wondering if you, I'm just wondering if you comment more about what you might do with that, because I can imagine there's a lot of very interesting things you could do, looking at the advertising traffic and you know the, the piracy stuff's obviously stripping that out. Yeah. Um Half of the traffic rows are ads, so I don't know about bytes, but. Um, it might be really small packets, but you can see like every little, every, if you imagine when you load a web page, there's like a little image here, a little image there. Like even that Twitter engage button, we can see that coming through separately as a different line. Um, you can see the little JPEG as a separate line. Um, and so there's a lot of double click refreshes. Um, and so that's a good question. I mean, that's a whole other paper. We could measure ad tech. Um, yeah. Yeah, but to the extent that it affects our analysis, um, we do have a variable where we measure non everything else, like non-streaming activity, as the all else category. So um, maybe that has to be split out by ad tech and then actual engagement. Yeah. And then, yeah, right there, Peter, I think. Now I'm going to top that conversation with a really stupid question. Um, have, you, have you looked into are you, or are you understanding why people pirate content? So what, I mean, presumably it has to do with cost maybe, but are you sure it's only cost or are there other factors, convenience, availability of content? Is this something you, you, you have looked into and you can talk about? Um, we, 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 we could actually measure, I mean, Maybe we should. So we have the zip code, and so we can overlay broadband deployment numbers on top of this data set. So maybe if they're in a rural area, they don't have good broadband. We also have the ISP name, so whichever. So I mean, we could we could even add that, like maybe maybe the FCC data overlaid on this will explain that households with you know lower deployment numbers broadband or pirating more, um, but that's another step. So it's do. still a puzzle to us because, I mean, we, we, like if you think about this first equation, what, what, if, what um, is correlated with people wanting to pirate, um, the things, and, and some of the figures we showed, the things that were and weren't significant weren't necessarily what we expected. Like there's this, um, everyone believes that it's teenage boys who are, who are doing all the pirating, and we just didn't see that. Um, and so, you know, that's one theory out the door. I mean, maybe it's that 400-pound fat guy that you know Trump was talking about, the same one who is, you know, doing the elections, um, who's pirating. But uh, it, we, and then we saw, you know, that wealthier households, at least at the very, very high end, um, were doing more pirating. Um, that's probably not because they're wealthy, but because they're wealthy, they have better access or better, faster streams or something. Um, so. Uh, 
before we did this, I would have said, um, yeah, teenage boys and, and cost or something. But you know, at the moment, we're a little bit, we don't know. And if, if I could take a slightly different angle on that, I think, I think it's commonly said the piracy problem would go away if we just made everything available in every channel all at the same mm. time. And, and the, the problem with that is all, the, all these industries' business models are based around price discrimination and the idea of I've got a set of consumers who are willing to pay radically different amounts for this good that has zero marginal cost to me. I have to figure out a way to get the high value people to pay a high price. And traditionally, what we've done is, is windowing. If you get rid of all those windows, you've blown up their whole business model. Um, and you know, we have a paper that looks at the theatrical window. Right, The theatrical window is very important. And what, what we show is that when a movie leaks out before the theatrical window, it's correlated with about, or it causes about a 20% drop in theatrical revenue. Um, getting rid of all those windows is going to be a huge problem for the industry. Oh, and, and Ruth is waving her hand. I'm the woman who kind of yelled yesterday um, after the panel. Um, <laughs> I think all those things are right. I also think that our industry is a victim of what I call red carpet celebrity, which is they think that most people are wealthy and they're sitting in limousines drinking champagne. I don't think they understand that the average worker in the film business is working. They're working 12 hours a day, often six days a week. Um, and I think that that, so they think they're not really stealing from anybody but wealthy people. I also think that, please forgive me, but the platforms have aided and abetted and made pirated content so easy uh, that people type it in and they can find it. And so I don't, and all, I think you said something about that a lot of people don't know they're actually on pirate sites because some of them look so beautiful. Um, so I think it's a combination of everything that you said Plus, our, our industry has been devalued. But in film, television, music, all of it. Um, and that's a problem that we have to overcome on a consumer level, not just on an enforcement level, to educate kids about the fact that copyright actually has to do with them as creators themselves. Bob, um, Bob. I want to thank Jane for the sprint. Um, I thought it was a great paper and a great comment, and this is directed to anyone on the panel. Uh, a question Scott might have asked of me 15 years ago oh, man. in a kind of snide way. <laughs> um, how far are we away from actually being able to do an economic efficiency or welfare calculation? So, so you've got sort of some piracy uh, substitutes to apparently a large degree for some legit content. Um, you, you, Mike, you suggested there may be some papers out there that talk about the relationship between content and the incentive to develop new creative stuff uh, of the, the kind that Ruth was talking about. And I guess my question is, do you know anything about different policy levers and their impact on piracy? And can you actually draw out economic efficiency calculations, or have people done that? Well, yeah, but you should do it. We certainly talk about policies, right? So we've done we've done a lot of work on measuring the effectiveness of of policies. Um, and and a quick summary is very small change, or, or I, I would argue a relatively small change in the ease of pirating actually causes a lot of pirates to switch over to legal channels, smaller than you'd think either in terms of legal or in terms of, of search costs. Uh, so we have a paper that just got accepted at a, at a top journal um, that looks at, at Google search. And, and basically it finds that uh, we, we put, put, students in a, put students and adults in a lab and did a control treatment. Um, and if you move a pirate link from the first page to the second page, a whole bunch of people switch from piracy to legal. And even people who showed up saying, you know, free stream movie name, um, switch. Uh, so I, I think, and I'd be happy to send you any of these papers because that's the sort of self-absorbed person I am. Um, but in terms of a social welfare, you know, t t trying it, tying it back to 
how much are creators producing less because there's been a 10% drop in their revenues? We're a long way from that. That's an incredibly hard question. I mean, that's where Walt Fogel started. I mean, that's what he's been trying to do, right? Yeah, yeah. but even, even there, and you can, you can show a 10% drop, mm -hmm. but then down the road, how much does that cause me to invest less in, in movies? I believe it does, but, but a, a specific number is hard. And we're, we're, um, it's, it's another stage of the paper, but we can look at certain, not necessarily public policies, but when Amazon um, took Cody off its site, or at least made it very hard to find, that happened in the time period that we have. Yeah. Um, so we should, in, in principle, we can see whether we can notice something, but we're, we're not there yet. So website blocking works, uh, shutting down websites works, graduated, res graduated response, letter sending works. Um, you, can also, you can see all that in the data. I was back here. I have the mic. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, it's, it seems to me, looking at that, that the quantity is a big, big issue. And I was kind of thinking two things, maybe, is since you have time, and, and in many of these cases, you might know if it's HDTV or, or not, um, it's quality, that you may be able to convert everything into time, um, hours of information, you know, a movie, you know, you could convert bits to time, watching time might normalize everything, and that way the cross-elasticity would actually have a meaning. Yeah. And it seems to me the cross-elasticity would have to be bigger than one, bigger than minus one, uh, or more negative than minus one, oh. because the pirate movie is free. I mean, if you think of it, if you paid for everything, you got things for free, I'm going to consume more pirate stuff than I am the other, so that substitution effect is going to look bigger. The other thought was on the quantity was to look at if there's enough in the sample, if people, if there's certain people who have the Cody box and who stream illegally versus downloading movies and all that. So there's some sort of normalcy in what they're doing. So now you've got Roku v. Cody. What's the trade-off there? Um, and that might be, it might, it's going to shrink your sample probably considerably, mm -hmm. but at least the, in that case you're measuring time, mm -hmm. basically. So that's something that's kind of uniform across the two. Right. I mean, with four trillion observations, we, we, can, we can shrink the sample. Um, but do you want to talk about time? Because we, yeah, we spend a lot think, of time thinking um, about that. Maybe Richard mentioned that if, if we have a theory that low-income people are, have data caps on their broadband who are downloading lower, smaller files, not the high def, then I guess we could weigh the bytes downward for low income and then flatten everything into time from bytes. So, the, you know, there's some transformations we can do to the data. Um, but uh, yeah, every step we take, we need to have like compelling reasons for why we're doing, <laughs> like why we're flattening it this way and what, you know, what we believe about um, bytes to seconds. Um, and actually, just this is completely um, tangential, but um, working with this kind of data in the cloud is different from working with it on your desk because you have to think really carefully about the query that you make. If you make a mistake, you can charge yourself thousands of dollars by accident. Um, so it's, it's a lot different than when you can you know, just experiment on your computer with different uh, um, uh, specifications. That's interesting. So thank you guys for the, the paper. I over here. Oh, hey. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for the paper. Like, uh, I think you raise a, a lot of interesting questions. I had sort of two reactions to it: one to sort of zoom in, and one to sort of zoom out. So, you know, it struck me especially when you were giving the examples of uh, the particular pieces of pirated content that, and it makes a lot of sense. The file names tend to contain the name of the thing that is being pirated, um, and so. Uh, to get at some of the, the sort of windowing and economic impact questions, you know, one thought might be to, since you have time dates for e each instance where you've, uh, or timestamps on each instance of observation, you should be able to match, or theoretically it would be possible to match whether or not that particular piece of content was being windowed or was available through some sort mm. of substitute, right? So, you know, there's a difference between Moana when Moana is still in the theaters versus Moana when I can stream it on Netflix versus Moana where it's available online but not yet on a sort of by subscription service and I may need to pay, you know, $3.99 to rent it. Um, and so if you are able to sort of extract the particular file names, 
you might be able to to sort of tell some sort of story about what exactly is being uh, uh, pirated and, and where it fits within the window. Yeah. Um, the second thought to sort of like pull out but, but continue on this time question is um, that, you know, while the data set is large, one of the limits of it is that it, it only really captures sort of data going to households and presumably entertainment or things people might do when in non-working time is larger than just uh, data streaming into the home, right? And so if you are able to uh, get some sense of sort of pirated time versus non-pirated time and how that is distributed across different households, there are, you know, surveys of how people use their spare time or, um, and, and so, you know, it, the, it's possible that you, there's a substitution, but there's other sort of non-streaming substitutions that are either not being captured or, or aren't fully accounted for here. And so um, that, that assumes you're able to get to the time piece, which I know is a very complicated question in the first place, but if you're able to get there or if you're going down that road anyway to answer some of these other questions, um, thinking about sort of non-streaming uh, entertainment substitutions might be valid. Yeah, I mean, you also you raised um, the, the other hard question, which is that when people are just using their cellular data plan to, to watch, we don't see that, or when they're at work, we don't see that. So, um, there was a question up here. Has been... Thanks again, and very supportive of uh, all the research and, and looking forward to the, to the findings and the final papers. Um, one question that some of your comments made me think about is interactivity. So once, once a user is brought into a pirated ecosystem, right, it's, that, that may be a question of volition and the user comes there for whatever reason, but what are the, are, what are the sites doing to keep them there? Right? So for example, your point on advertising, is all that advertising legitimate advertising or is it advertising more pirated sites? Right, we've seen that in other places. Um, also, uh, other types of interactive services. So, to what extent are uh, sites pirated and otherwise uh, trading in pirated material? Are they actively engaging in uh, keeping users there? Are they recommending? Are they building ad networks around? Are they taking personal information and building ad networks on the back end to sell to others? What steps? are these websites taking and is there anything in your data that might show what is happening to keep pirate to keep users in the pirated ecosystem and i don't know if time i don't know what, what exactly is the proxy for that potentially some of that ad net, the ad data might be interesting there potentially what if you can see so for music the first pirated song right but then how many time, how long has that user stayed on that website listening to new songs and could you ever do a quick case study on how much of that was recommended, mm -hmm. right? Because certain, part, certain pieces of US law very, turn, very much turn on that question of interactivity, passive versus active engagement, um, and knowledge. Yeah, that's a really good question because one way that we measured um, engagement with websites was just seeing how long they were on the website. So sometimes you can't see if they're streaming or if they're just clicking around the website. So we do measure engagement and we do have all the ad data. So I, that's actually a really good point. Like we can study um, the ad networks around those sites. And you might be able to infer it just by clusters of similar visits, you know. Yeah. When, whenever somebody goes here, they, they're very likely to go here. Yeah, actually Nathaniel did do a multi-homing test too to see if these, these, if these pirate households are visiting many different pirate sites or if they're sticky to one. Um, and and most of, I think most of the households were, um, well, 25% were going to 10 different sites. Right. And then there's kind of a, a, a decline, um, nine, eight, seven. So, um, which is different from what I thought. I thought people would find one site and then stick to that, um, like that there'd be stickiness. But there's actually a lot of multi-homing. They're going around to different sites. You also um, made another point that you were much too polite to say, which is that there's a lot of institutional detail missing from this right now. Um, and we need to know, you know more about these specific sites and how they work and so on. So, but we, yeah. There's thank another being thesis so here, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Hi, um, thank you for your, thank you for the panel. It's been really interesting. And I thought we'd done piracy to death, but it was a really interesting angle and I'm really looking forward to your papers. Um, 
We, I'm at a university and we actually are kind of a lab for this sort of thing because we've got vast amounts of bandwidth and 60,000 students and 10,000 mm. staff. And two years ago, we became con concerned about the amount of piracy going on on our networks that we would be liable for. And it was a breach of our terms of use. So we decided to, to block torrents. And uh, I, I decided to block torrents, actually. <laughs> and um, I assumed everyone on campus would be angry with me. And it turns out uh, that staff were able to have, if they had a legitimate need for, business need for, Torrents could come and see me and get an exemption. And students, we discovered, they were torrenting at home and they were coming to, they were just picking up their laptop and bringing it to campus and they were continuing to torrent there much faster than at home. But they were typically not intending to do that. It was just a, a, a factor of mm. the fact that it, torrent, you don't, you've got your torrents running in the background and you don't really know that they're, they're, they're there, you're just torrenting. And so that behaviour of, it's just something you do and you don't really care where it happens and if you can connect to a faster network, all that happens is your torrents happen faster. Uh, so, and the thing was that the students didn't really understand that what they were doing was illegal. And I was part of a um, anti-piracy campaign in Australia and it just doesn't cut through. It just it does not get through to them and they, they were like, why are you blocking torrents? Because it's illegal. If you have a legitimate need for a torrent, you can sign this form and I'll give you access to it. And they were like, but I'm, that's not illegal, it's just there, it's how we do it. So that, that very much is in the culture. So I, I think all these anti-piracy messages are not cutting through and no one believes them if they are. That's fascinating, really interesting. Um, okay, but then Diana. All right, Diana. Um, did malware pop up as a variable in any aspect of your analysis? Are you able to look at the quality of the pirated content? Last time you asked me a question, I had to work for a year and a half to answer. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. I'll get back to you. <laughs> so I can jump in. Uh, CMU has a, has a lab on campus, which is kind of like ComScore data, mm -hmm. except we also get every process that's running on the user's machine. And so what you can do with that is you can say, if you visit a pirate site, are you more likely to have a malware process that ends up on your, on your machine? And the answer is yes, mm -hmm. and strongly yes. You know, Tom Galvin, Digital Citizens Alliance, has a report that's th over 30%, you know, and he has a new one coming out I talked to him last week, I think, in a couple of weeks that we'll update it. I was going to just address the, the piracy, anti-piracy messaging. So uh, the problem I see with our business is we tell people to show up, pay up, and shut up. And we <laughs> when they go to the theater. So we st instituted a series of thank you spots, which Disney uh, is using on every one of their movies. And so when you go to see a Disney movie, It'll have part of the cast and crew saying thanks. Thanks without you, the audience. None of this could be possible. Um, Disney, because they have an entire department full of psychiatrists, which I, <laughs> I love, hmm. did a study on the two first spots. Um, and it showed that there was a 20% increase in desire for the survey respondents to then actually legitimately purchase and a 20% decrease in the desire to, to um, pirate because you're putting faces to people and you're also thanking them for being part of the process. So that's, and I'm happy to share that data with you if you ever want it. Yeah, I do think Leslie John's presentation two days ago on behavioral um, responses from people clicking um, or, or framing um, options really makes a lot of sense. Okay. I think we've exhausted all the questions. Um, and I guess with that, that is the end of uh, the 2018 forum. So thank you all for coming, and thanks to the TPI staff for all the work they did, especially Jane and Ashley, who make everything happen. Um, I cannot emphasize enough <laughs> how important they are. And um, we'll see you all next year. And the dates are what, Jane? August? You wrote it down? Um, oh, August 18th to August 20th, 2019.
right here.